In today's episode of Age of Visionaries, we talk to John from Gong. We talk about the importance of personal communication in the time of AI. Stay tuned. Welcome to HR Visionaries, where we unlock the secrets of modern HR. I'm Benjamin, your host. Join us as we shed light on today's HR universe with HR leaders and innovators from across the globe. Whether you're an HR pro, a business leader, or just curious about the future of work, this is your shortcut to the forefront of HR innovation. Brought to you by Hire, the AI talent attraction platform. Welcome to our latest episode of HR Visionaries. I'm looking forward to my guest today. John, it's great to have you. Great to be here. Thanks for the invite. I appreciate it. John, can you tell us in a few sentences, who are you? So John Keenan is my name. I currently lead uh, recruitment in EMEA for uh, Gong, the revenue intelligence platform. So I've been in talent acquisition now for, I think it's probably in some shape or form, 17 years, which is kind of scary. Um, <laughs> uh, across, I spent about five years in agency recruitment and then went in-house and of 11 years within tech with uh, with nine of those being in, in leadership within tech and three different tech companies to be specific. Lovely. So why did you become a... Uh, an HR leader in the first place? Um, so I did a degree in psychology um, mm -hmm. and I did a master's in psychology and I and people always interested me, their motivations, their just human behavior in general. Um, and that was something that, you know, was the basis of what I wanted to do mm -hmm. in my career. So it was, it was very much like, how can I work with people, number one? Um, and then I thought human resources would be a good opportunity to do that and talent acquisition um, even more so in the sense that I'd really get to interact with as many people as possible. So it really just came from a passion for for psychology, reading human behavior and um, interacting with people. How does, well, reading human, um, human beings, reading people um, help you in your daily life nowadays <laughs> all the time um <laughs> all the time i think it's yeah I, i'd be, just be fascinated um when you're interacting with people of all levels just watching how they would operate certainly from a recruitment perspective that certainly helps you know you you look to identify what's needed for a business uh, from a people perspective both culturally and then technically so certainly it helps in that regard And then just general communication when you're just like communicating with executives, people at all levels. Uh, I think having a good grounding in psychology certainly helps. It's uh, I would highly recommend anybody who is kind of starting out to look at psychology as a as a degree that can open up any door, any door, like any 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 career. Really, you can start with that basis. It's a uh, phenomenal. Um. I must say, I find it always quite quite funny that it, in 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 many um, in, well in, in so many ways we educate ourselves and um, well we educate ourselves mainly in everything that's related to well techniques or related to yeah. um, to knowledge. However, yeah. um, I, I think most leaders fail in reading people, listening. And not just like listening to reply, but listen to understand. Totally. And that's a totally different thing, isn't it? It's uh, And that happens so many times, doesn't it? It's a great point because when that happens, you're just waiting, aren't you? You're not actually active listening and that goes out the window. And um, I was actually speaking to a colleague this week around that exact point. And um, sometimes the less said, the better. And when you then communicate and speak, it has more impact. So, so you know, it, it's sometimes people miss that. I think for sure, and uh, it's um, you know, it it doesn't create very coherent or productive conversations from a work perspective. Maybe okay in the pub after, you know, a few pints and watching a match, or <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> How can you teach yourself becoming a good listener? 
um experience number one um making mistakes um really getting feedback from your teams like when i initially stepped up as a leader about 10 years ago um until my first leadership position um i i i was very much of the opinion that this is the way i've done it hmm. so you yeah, know and i i was successful at that and that's the reason i got promoted um so this must be the only way so i went in with a very directive approach to leadership and um didn't take that feedback didn't take that listen to the different opinions as much as i should have um and i got that feedback and um it was totally fair and totally accurate but it hurt you know at the time mm -hmm. um so many people that, don't ask right the, yeah exactly and that that was that was a learning that was a learning for me that um you know you have to you have to just sometimes observe watch listen and you know let other people speak um don't be afraid of um having people that are better than you in many in every way on the team at a more junior level you should be looking for you always should be looking for a successor you should be looking to develop train and not be afraid of that actually be empowered by that and sometimes as a leader the less you're doing the better job you're you, you're doing in many ways when you've got it right if you're in things too much there, there's usually something inefficient i would say um well you just mentioned that well you uh learned this as a leader um and um well it's it sometimes sometimes tough how can you well be yourself a better leader by uh well allowing yourself to to fail allowing yourself to well to to enable us um a culture to enable um a, a team culture where people speak up where people are yeah. well do not hide their opinions yeah. but are empowered to speak up Yeah, totally. How, how is the question? How do you set that environment? Exactly, exactly. So, yeah. um, given well, it it you can't just ask for it, right? There needs yeah. to be like a culture. There needs to be an environment where people feel it's appreciated if they speak up. Yeah, totally. So, so, so I guess what that is that comes from, like, if it's your direct team, it comes from the leader. You've got to set the the ground where it rules initially to empower people by creating a very safe space by literally saying that this is a safe space where we can all communicate without judgment and we're all going to respect each other's views we're going to you know and then you if people aren't talking up still in that environment you then you'd literally you'd look for them to talk and you'd um, be quite directive in that way it's about flexing the style i guess with that but it's about empowering it's about setting the the environment and it's it's about leading from the front showing vulnerability in your leadership style that you don't have all the answers certainly i certainly in any role i, I don't i absolutely don't um and just being really clear about that and just saying okay it's okay to speak up safely it's okay to fail mm -hmm. um everybody fails everybody makes mistakes and just because you're a manager or a leader doesn't mean you know everything you certainly don't you um you know <laughs> I suppose you have some of the answers, but the whole idea of a team is you work it out together. Um, so there are some ideas that that I would do, but it's probably more about showing more of yourself and vulnerability that um, mistakes are okay. So if you speak up and you say something that's perceived as incorrect, that's totally okay. That's fine. Um, but the flip on that, I guess, is, um, you know, if you do empower people to speak up and empower people to make mistakes, the the real winning part of that I find is when mistakes happen, they let you know about them and they go, we've made a mistake and then you can do something about it mm -hmm. to support. The challenge comes is if you're in a stifled, negative, maybe environment that um, fear is prevalent, um, people will hide those mistakes and then you're blindsided by them and then they're doubly as bad. And so having that that environment of trust, and that's another word, an environment to trust means that mistakes aren't something that people are afraid of. There's something that, you know, that will occur. And that's where innovation occurs as well, isn't it? You know, and um, in those types of environments, because people are going to try things um, and not be afraid to fail. But I guess, you know, 
you know, there's also a maturity piece with that for people mm -hmm. that they can they can make mistakes, but it doesn't mean they can just start making mistakes everywhere. It's more they're empowered to share, I would say. So that's a lot there. That's but that's what I would say. Um, I think in particular showing vulnerability is is a super interesting point you just uh, made. Um, given well, I think many HR leaders or many leaders in general fear showing vulnerability because they they feel like okay, my credibility may be shred, or um, yeah. it's like people question the very basis why I am or the very foundation why I am the leader of this group. If I show vulnerability, they may question me as leader, may question my work. So, um, how do you how do you find that balance? Um, one, of course, should not appear like okay, I, I don't know at all what I'm doing here. Um, so, therefore, guide me, please. So, I think this, uh, I think there's uh, for for many people a bit of a fear. So, where where am I in, in that? There is, that there absolutely, continuum? Yeah. there absolutely is, and it's um, but it's very powerful. If a leader shows that that aspect of themselves where, you know, they acknowledge a mistake, they acknowledge they, they acknowledge that they don't know the answer. There's like because there is nothing worse when you ask a leader and they just give you a fluffy answer where they're just answering it just to look like they know what they're talking about. Um, there's nothing, nothing, you know, that that would lose credibility more than saying you don't know the answer. If you know what I mean, that's the that's the flip side. Um, so it's, it's very powerful thing when leaders do that, I find at, at big time and, and in particular, the more senior they get actually, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, I suppose the art of leadership in many ways is it's delegation really at the end of the day, it's about the team. It's not about the leader. How do you, you mentioned before the, um, well, environment where you, where people feel empowered to speak up, um, where yeah. people don't, don't fear that their opinion may also be like wrong it could also be like okay i speak up and i do say something that's actually wrong but i think it's it's just important to create this, this environment where people are also allowed to say something something wrong um how yeah. do you how do you how do you create such an environment and avoid those microaggressions i, I think m most most people would perhaps agree um it is not necessarily a thing that i like i don't value any other opinion or I don't like when people speak up. But I think it's very often these kind of micro yeah. that then make those people who voice their opinion go like, eh, I've done I've done it once. It's appreciated. Yes, I know, but I don't want this kind of micro aggressions. I, I feel then sell I, I feel myself like yeah, not not uh, appreciated. I felt myself uncomfortable. So, so how, how is the question? So, how would you look to avoid those in a team? Those micro absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So, how do you avoid those micro aggressions that it make people like once they speak up feel like mm, they it's say that, it's that, appreciated. However, it's well, I don't feel it's appreciated. That that's not just on the leader to do that. That's on it's on the leader to set the environment, mm -hmm. but then hold the individuals and employees accountable if mm -hmm. that is occurring. And that's when, as a leader, you would have to step in and you would have to uh, call people out on if they are, you know, responding in a negative manner to people to do that. And listen, you know, everybody has bad days. Everybody has bad moments and can react with the microaggression, maybe even subconsciously on certain things. But it's about calling it out if it's consistent and it's there. And, um, you know, once you do that and you do that fairly quickly, I think generally you can address that kind of thing. John, uh, it, it could speak a lot about about leadership, and I really appreciate your your, your thoughts there. Um, can you also tell us a bit about what are the topics you currently deal with most? So, what is like on your on your table on a daily basis? Yeah, totally. So, obviously, talent acquisition is my stock and trade. So, it's talent, talent in the business, talent coming in. Who's in the pipeline? Is there adequate diversity in the pipeline? Um, is there efficiency in terms of how people are moving through the pipeline? So that would be the the kind of stock and trade. Um, relationships with the leaders in the business, just ensuring that I understand exactly what's going on uh, from a pulse perspective. Because everybody in my role, like from a recruiting leader perspective, the people who do it well are the people that aren't just working or the team isn't just working the open positions. 
it's working the positions that will occur down the mm-hmm. line and building the pipeline around that, whether that's due to potential attrition, uh, growth that may occur, you know, so you're, 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 you're constantly trying to look around those corners, so to speak, um, and plan for that. And good recruiting um, organizations, from my experience, do that, and they do that really effectively. And um, so when a role comes up, you know, there's there's a more proactive pipeline and those gaps are less prevalent and they're not too timely. So that's that's what I would say is top of my mind weekly looking at that. Um, well, building networks within the organization, um, in particular these days when many people work um, on a hybrid basis or work, yeah. work from home permanently, um, how do you ideally do that? So we work in a hybrid schedule right now, which I think works really, really effectively. Um, obviously, the world was remote. For, sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry um, um, what does um, hybrid in your case, uh, in your case mean? Can you describe I, hybrid means detail? it's it's a mix a mix of uh, days in the office and working remotely and, so and right, how, how, three days in the office is typically what we do okay, and well, two days okay. at remote mm-hmm. and i feel that's the sweet spot um mm-hmm. for to answer your question specifically because it's you get to build those relationships in person and you never underestimate the power of that from a mm-hmm. building credibility um even the and this is through the pandemic, the things I had forgotten about, but the the like the kind of water cooler moments, the you know, the jokes, the banter, the those little things, the levity. When you're at home, you're you're very task orientated and you're very mm-hmm. efficient. And you you know, you certainly will get things done. But I find with the hybrid piece when you're in the office. You can schedule your day where, you know, it's more about those relationships, more about those one to one meetings. It's more about those um, finding time to joke, et cetera. And then you've got a time where you're more busy and you're more focused on delivery. And uh, yeah, you don't call anyone to tell a joke, right? You hit. So you don't call anyone to tell a joke. No, no, you don't really, do you? Like, um, so it's just having a bit the, the fun and the levity and lucky to work in a company gong where in dublin we have a really strong culture really um you know really nice place to be when you're in the office you you enjoy it you enjoy those relationships but i find when you're remote and this is not just from a gong perspective in previous roles and obviously through the pandemic um everybody was remote um is like sometimes when particularly in recruiting it's all about results at the end of the day it's all about you know filling certain roles for the business and silence can be you know the the, the business can sense that's inactivity or they can sense that's something that it isn't so that proactive communication when you actually see somebody can address so much um that sometimes over a slack you can't do so mm-hmm. i think there's a double-edged sword there but it, so for me hybrid works but i do i do appreciate the ability to work from home and uh the ability to kind of do both i i i wouldn't be crazy on full-time in the office because i'm from an efficiency standpoint and then um so for you it's like okay two days at home um working on on task being very task oriented and then three days in the office um relationships um, relationships with like internal team. stakeholders with your team um yeah. and um what do you think are the most important um well most important tasks to 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 execute when building a great network within your own company yeah what are the most like so i suppose it's understanding the org design for number one who sits where that's the first thing I'd always do in a company. It's building that out, understanding who are, who are the leaders of each function and um, being very intentional about setting up regular connects with them and um, doing that, seeking to understand who those people are, not only from a professional perspective, but also from a personal perspective. So you get to build that rapport um, and then it's just consistent meeting. And then when you're, you know, my department is doing their the business for them, it's building that trust. Mm-hmm. And proactively communicating with them is what I would say, what I mentioned. So, you know, if something isn't going to plan, just ensuring that they know about that. And that's similar to what we discussed earlier about the speaking up, you know, 
everything's never going to be perfect. So it's just proactively communicating with them is what I find um, builds a trustworthy relationship. So there's that's some ideas of what I would do. It's uh, it's not rocket science. It's not rocket science. It 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 it's consistency and it's um, it's building that trust and that human side is is key to any business relationship at any level with that. And then it's obviously delivery execution and um, and consistency. Consistency. I would say um, consistency. I mean, like it's it's not just delivery on you know what you're doing. It's a uh, consistency of meeting consistency of reporting you know so they know if i'm going to say an exec standpoint they know exactly where they stand and there's no surprises back to that point you know they're not blindsided so they know exactly what's going on good or bad um well um as, as gong is also a fast growing company uh, you, you probably had some um some some challenges meeting yeah. business expectations in the past okay. um given well growth um, and then well talent acquisition they have to keep up totally totally like there's in every role i've worked in in tech there's always challenges with you know and it's it's simple reason recruitment is very tangible so when you're in hyper growth companies in particular if recruitment is behind it's very obvious and um you know, and the nature of the beast is if you're hiring at volume, that will happen from time to time. It's just inevitable. So again, it's just back to how you proactively communicate, having a very clear strategy in place. And sometimes the business may be like, well, I'm not sure about that. And you're like, no, I've got my strategy. We're going to deliver. You just got to trust me. And then when you do, you've built that trust. And then if you don't, you 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 flag it very, very early. But to answer your question, uh, yeah, there absolutely has been instances where there has been, um, you know, we've fallen behind and the business may have been frustrated. And all it is is just understanding what their frustration is, addressing it and showing transparency into what's going on. And um, generally, you can address it. And it's it's never it's never personal. It's never personal. It's 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 totally, you know, it's usually sales are looking to reach this number and if recruiting don't give the talent at a certain time, it, it it impacts on them. And But there's also a lot of other dependencies in there as well. There's planning, there's finance, there's all of these things to, to make it work perfectly. Uh, so you got to ensure that's all tied together. Um, you just said it's not personal, it's never personal. Yeah. How do you ensure it's never personal given what well, in particular in a high growth environment, everyone is like very invested emotionally and like, yeah. okay, what's going on? Um, let's say I'm a sales um, executive in a, um, in a fast growing company. Well, my goals increase every year massively, every, well, every quarter probably massively. So I'm personally highly invested. How do you make sure it's not personal and it's not emotional then? So from my perspective, do you mean, how would I ensure or from their perspective? From both, right? So okay. you actually have to deal with both. So it's like, okay, John, I need to increase our ARR massively over the next month. I need people. Where are they? Yeah. Well, then you just set the expectations very clearly at the outset um, of what can and can't be done. So you just use a very focused data-driven approach with that. But, you know, how do you stop it being personal? You just you just stick to the data and you're just very clear. And then if there is what which can happen, frustration sometimes occurs from time to time. You, you just revert to what you'd said at the outset. And, you know, you just say that with that consistency and generally nobody I, I that wouldn't worry me this stage if, mm -hmm. if you're not know, seeing it. And it's it's you, you just revert to what you're had had agreed on at the outset what the strategy is what the plan and then you just you're consistent with that and generally generally there's not too many issues to be honest it's um but you will get that from time to time i would i certainly wouldn't take it personally but maybe that's experience that isn't the case mm -hmm. in the past um i probably would have you know ruminated over that message you'd get from a senior sales exec about where is this and what you know what's happening here or whatever that is and that's where sometimes the danger of an email or a slack mm -hmm. is taken totally out of context. So that's where I'm back to what I was saying about those face-to-face -face relationships can help. But um, so it's it, it's just seeking to understand when a frustration occurs 
And once you do that, generally, you can come to a, a solution. You're all on the same team at the end of the day. And I think that's an important thing to, to remember. Um, and then from the other side as well, from a stakeholder, how would you keep that not personal? Um, I guess if from an exec perspective, if that's happened from time to time where they may show frustration, you know, they want you to do certain things that are unrealistic. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there may be some emotion that comes into that. You, you just be consistent. You just stick to what you've you've said, as I mentioned at the outset. And And, and sometimes just saying nothing, doing nothing. You said your bit and you just keep doing what you're doing. And generally that's the best way sometimes. Ne- never get dragged in, never get, you know, into a, you know, back and forth. That's not productive for anybody. So you're better saying sometimes if, if that has happened, it has happened years ago with one particular exec, obviously won't mention. And, um, you know, it, it got pretty, it, it got pretty, you know, emotional from that side. And it was just, you know, reverting to what I'd said and then being consistent, as I said, and then then just saying, well, I, I've said my bit. I'm just going to get on with my job and usually fizzles out. Yeah, I think what you said, what you said is, is really important that a lot comes with maturity, right? So with like yeah. uh, having experienced many of those situations and um, well, then, well, cool heads to prevail, um, so, so, so I, I talk about this quite a lot, actually, in work. It's, it's be, being calm mm-hmm. is so important. Just sometimes, like, because in any company, any tech company, any industry you're in, and the more senior you get, like, it, there's going to be more things thrown at you. There's going to be more scenarios. There's going to, things are going to drop. Um, and, but, like, instead of, being worrying about that and instead of just expect it and then just stay like when things are going exceptionally well stay fairly grounded when things are going badly stay fairly grounded Mm -hmm. stay kind of keep the same baseline and if you can do that that can be difficult sometimes but if you can do that generally generally you're fine so don't over don't overthink it when it's going amazing and don't overthink it if it's going badly would be my advice there you have been in talent acquisition for 17 years, you mentioned. Um, yeah. What were for I you? Would be... yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's incredible, right? So I had to write that on that in uh, yeah. 17 years, a pretty long time. Um, what were the um, most remarkable developments within those 17 years um, that did you, you look back? And, and 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 you find this okay? Well, this has changed talent acquisition, or it has also changed me as a talent acquisition um, leader. Totally, totally. I, well, it's very obvious for me. The first one is when I started in recruitment. It was agency, as I mentioned, recruitment it was very database driven. So it was very much who had the contacts was the winner. Um, LinkedIn, LinkedIn was. I, I was there right at the outset of that. And um, I remember just being blown away that it took away that database and put that out there and then LinkedIn recruiter specifically. Mm-hmm. I remember I I just worked, I, I worked in Deloitte for a couple of years. That was my first kind of in-house role in like 2011. And um, I remember implementing LinkedIn recruiter and I was totally blown away. I was like, wow, this is phenomenal. This is a total game changer. And I was like, I really want to work in LinkedIn. And then, it was almost like um, serendipity. I got an approach from LinkedIn. I was like, right, I'm totally doing this. So so LinkedIn recruiter. And then I got my first leadership role in LinkedIn. So it would really I have a very soft spot for that product. And, um, you know, so I thought that was a total game changer. That literally overnight, um, it meant you could, the whole passive market was there at your fingertips. And what I would say next is probably probably right now if I'm being honest, what like since then, LinkedIn, LinkedIn recruiter, I felt there was almost a phase of a decade mm-hmm. where that was the the top. Mm-hmm. And now it's, it's you know, what everybody's talking about, obviously, is this AI revolution that we're in now. The, like, and we're, I don't, I don't even know if we know yet. We don't, the full no. kind of what's happening. I, I'm but sure we don't. But from a TA perspective, the efficiencies that can be gained already are phenomenal. 
So if you want to, for example, if you're reaching out to a candidate, you can draft with AI, you can, you know, it can, from a sourcing perspective, the intelligence you can use, it can help you really source great talent. It can let you know if somebody's more likely to be available, somebody, you know, their their behavior, a lot of this, phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. Other um, areas as well, which I find fascinating is actual interviewing. So if you're looking at interviewing and um, you can look at kind of some software out there, which will record the interviews, will actually ascertain insights um, as well. Gong has a has a, a product um, which isn't on the market, but we, we would use internally. And you can actually record interviews. You can ascertain insights on that. You can have coaching opportunities for your team. Um, obviously, simple things like note taking. You don't have to do things like that. So, 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 so I'm seeing huge potential in that, like huge, huge. And that's that's probably the most excited I've been since LinkedIn Recruiter. Because I remember the excitement I had when I started used that for the first time, and it just made everything LinkedIn Recruiter. I could do more with less. Back to using that term, and now. I feel there's even more opportunity with some of the software, which is only touching the surface. So they're, they're the kind of two, if I was looking at two aspects, there's obviously loads more in between that's happened. And I think talent brand is another piece that um, has really developed in the last decade. You know, how you brand your company, how you position it, you know, think like a marketer, you know, some of the tools you can use there is also interesting. Uh, so they'd be, the, they'd be the areas I'd say. It's super interesting that it's, well, everyone I talk to uh, basically mentions AI and, well, I 100% agree with you, John, that, well, at the moment, we, we're still um, still at the very beginning, the very top of the iceberg, I guess. Um, interesting. Given... It, it, and there's a lot of fear out there, isn't there? There's, there, like, I think with people and it's interesting. I, I heard, like, again, we're still early stages with it, but I think instead of being afraid of it, my recommendation is to really learn about it understand it mm -hmm. it's not like obviously jobs will be lost per se i think jobs will be lost for people who don't get, understand it and build their knowledge in it so that, that'll be my kind of view it's about really digging in whatever industry you're in building an understanding of how this will impact it and getting ahead of it with that mm -hmm. and, and with that there's huge opportunity see there's almost a first mover advantage at the minute with what's going on absolutely and uh, well um i'd like to think of it as more like it's about the experience right so when you think about for example consumer apps where we had uh, ai now now for for quite some time and, yeah. and now it is also more and more in the hr tech space um it, it's not that well that, that well it's about people losing their jobs it's just like okay the experience for everyone is much better the efficiency is much better and what, what we talked about in, in in the very beginning so we want to talk to people right so we want well as as people to have the opportunity to not write lengthy messages but we want to well do the message part by can be done by the machine and then we focus on the personal communication there that's a, that's a really great point because you know i mentioned from from like say note-taking perspective with that exactly. if you're interviewing some typically you're you're doing this and you're writing something down and now you get to focus on that one-on-one -on -one human relationship with that and uh that's i don't see any downside to that yeah yeah I, I totally agree and i think it's going to be um incredibly um incredibly cool um it just like well taking away all those boring repetitive tasks that are well valuable indeed however they're not great fun doing and also like it doesn't require too much brain power i also um appreciate well ai very much as a as a liberator from all these tasks and well obviously um note taking is one of those tasks where it's like nobody okay, likes that well, exactly right. So, so in particular, when it's going to, going to be really exciting, you you yeah. love to focus on the conversation rather than all on all the note taking, right? Totally, totally, totally. But but that that's what I'm seeing is you know, and I I would be genuinely excited about and lucky enough to work in a in a company born in AI and you know has been in that space even before all of this, and uh, so I I I think it's just super exciting, super exciting. And again, we haven't touched the surface.
at all. Indeed, indeed. Um, John, it was great talking to you. Really, uh, really enjoyed our conversation. Um, um, yeah, it was super cool. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the time. Much appreciated. Lovely. And um, well, all of you, thanks a lot for listening in and see you next time. Oh, 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 oh,